Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, let's just cut that. No, no that's going <laughs> on. Perfect. Hey, guys. It's us again, and we've got Kyle this time. So I'm Luke. This is Glenn. And that's Kyle. Kyle. Hey. And we're a bit further on the build, so giving you a bit of a progress update and let you know what we've been up to, mainly what Glenn's been up to. Last we saw, there was an engine on a bench, which is that prototype motor there in the bike. And now we've built a frame around it. So Glenn, give us a bit of a rundown, you know, where you started with the frame and, and uh, how it's got to here. So yeah, based from the uh, last video where we were showing the CAD images and using the Gixa 150 sort of forks and swing arm. So that's the Gixa 150 forks and headstock because the wheel fits and the brakes are good. And it's also the Gixa 150 swing arm. We basically played in CAD connect the dots for the new chassis and here we are now. There's been no science gone into this. It's like, <laughs> it, it looks good, therefore it is good. A whole bunch of guesswork. Yeah, yeah. You know. So give us a quick rundown of what, what's all this stuff and, and how do you get the whole the bike square and how do you get it into the dimensions that you wanted it to be? Right, so this is the worst frame jig you've ever seen. But basically I've got some tubes up here that are welded to the headstock and uh, we use the, I have a digital laser level so we could set our headset angle and make sure we're plumb forward and aft and then same with the swing arm <coughs> we've set the swing arm angle with the digital level and then there's a <coughs> tube underneath there and that's welded to the swing arm currently to lock everything in place yep. um, this let us set our wheelbase so we've got the wheelbase quite short um, we're 1280 wheelbase 23 degree headset angle 88 mil trail best guess at what's going to work well as a bucket in theory a reasonable forward weight bias and then the rest of it is like it's literally just connect the dots. The Gixxer 150 swing arm is actually a really long swing arm. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. So the Gixxer swing arm is sort of like 80 mil longer than a FXR 150 or a similar bike swing arm. Um, push the motor forward, which is, you can see we're tight for clearance here, but we've got small pipes to go on it and it works well for the weight distribution. How did you actually start to build the chassis? So you got the wheels where they need to be on this jig. You know, you measured it with your laser level and that sort of stuff. How did you actually then join the dots and make sure that it matches what's on the the CAD drawing okay so we'll come around here the most critical components once you get your swing arm angle pivot position fixed and the headset angle fixed is then you have to lock the motor into where the motor needs to sit so those that's there and that there are the motor mounts because we have our plastic 3d printed cases we just sat that on some fucking paint tins and shit yeah. <laughs> until it sat <laughs> until it sat in the right place in the right angle and then just tack welded everything. Oh! <laughs> Pretty straight, is it? Straight as me. It's on video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is definitely going in. <laughs> to make sure it was all good. So once I locked in these three, well, these three locations plus the headset angle, then that's what gave us the ability. We start at the top tube. The top tube is the most difficult. It's got two bends in it. It's one here and then one here. Um, tie those in, and then the rest of it's then just playing. Literally connect the dots. Tell us a bit about the steel that you used for this chassis and, and why you chose it. So it's all just mild steel. No no fancy chromoly or anything. Simply for bending. It's difficult to bend chromoly. Uh, this is nice and easy to bend. We don't have a marginal bender, so this is bent on a cheap bender. You do get some collapse of the tube, uh, which I don't think is going to be a problem in our application. The main chassis rails are 1.6 mil, just to give us some more st stiffness around the bent components. Anything that's bent is 1.6, and then anything that's straight is 1.2. Tell us a bit about this addition to the swing arm, because obviously it's the Jixxer swing oh, yeah, arm, yeah. <laughs> but you've put a whole bunch of extra steel. I'll come around here so the microphone works. You put a whole bunch of extra steel in the swing arm here, yeah, so the swing arm, you can see, is a fairly small box section uh, and very long. So obviously long, skinny thing, quite flexible, likes to walk around. So at the moment, I've wanted to add some stiffness in, in this plane. And by adding these tubes here, and there'll be some gussets and things to go on. This is, we're all still just tacked up at the moment. That will stiffen the swing arm in that plane. What I won't currently do is stiffen any torsional flex through the swing arm. Because we have no diaphragm through here. Yeah, and 
what I've been saying as well is I think that torsional flex might actually be good for you know grip on the track because when you're on the side of the tyre, the shock's not doing any work. Your swing arm does have to have some flex for the bike to actually continue to have grip on the track. So you were saying you're going to leave this as it is, so it is flexible. And if we you know get some low speed chatter sort of stuff, then you'll add some some bracing, right? Yep, it's easier to add a tube and cut it out. So. We'll try it at this and see how it performs. And it's quite easy to tell chassis stiffness, chassis too stiff, high frequency chatter, chassis too soft, low frequency chatter. As a rider, it's pretty easy to discern the difference. And then the shock, what have you done with the shock? Obviously it's a stock Jixxer shock, but have you changed the angle of it or anything like that? Nope, uh, the Jixxer 150, believe it or not, pretty much have the angle of the shock optimized for the most progression that you can get from a shock without a linkage. So no linkage shock direct. You can't quite get the same progression out of it, but you can get about five to six percent, I think. I can't remember with the angle of the shock, and also the it's a progressive spring on it, so yeah, you do yeah. you do get some progression. But at bucket level and power level, what we're at, the progressiveness of the shock, in my opinion, is not it's not that important. Yeah, you can work around it. So I can see here as well, you've decided to make the rear sets part of the chassis instead of doing bolt-on rear sets, and the same with the subframe. Yep. What's the idea behind doing all that as one piece? First of all, there's no bolt-on parts. We can't buy shit for this. Yeah. So if we crash the bike and we bend the, the rear sex or the subframe, I have to make it. I can't just go to the shop and buy one and bolt it on. It's really easy to put an angle grinder through here and then just weld new tubes on, which I have to make anyway. So doing a bolted connection, it's just more parts, more connections, more complexity, more weight. It's, uh, yeah. The chassis, that's pretty much the guts of it. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, the only thing that we're still missing is there will be some bracing from the from this point here on the chassis down to a, an engine mount on the frame, uh, engine mount on the motor, sorry. It's not there yet on the um, prototype cases, but we will add it. I think that's about where we're at with the chassis. There's still a couple of tubes. We've got to put one through here and one through here and just to stop the chassis trying to splay under loads and then we're done. What was the biggest surprise? I heard something about the weight of the wheels with the Gixxer 150. Yeah, so bucket people, I don't know. <laughs> well, we're giving that secret <laughs> away, sure away are we? Way, right. <laughs> if anyone doesn't know, Gixxer 150 wheels are the perfect size for bucket. They're a 2.5 inch front, 3.5 inch rear, and they are remarkably light. For we, yeah, we, we weighed the front and rear on this, and with the discs on, but not the sprocket carrier, they were 10 kilos total for both wheels, which is pretty light, yeah, so <laughs> considerably light. In comparison, we had some um, racing boys and some, some Thailand wheels came up on Facebook and I got the guy selling them to weigh them and they were pretty much the same. The difference between a, a lightweight racing wheel and some the world's cheapest yeah. <laughs> Shepherd yeah. wheels. Stock Jixxer 150 Yeah, wheels. so uh, <laughs> there you go. Anyway, so anyone's yeah. looking for wheels for a bucket, Jixxer 150 wheels. Mo yeah. Most wreckers have, have them available as well. Yeah. yeah. yeah lots, for like 500 bucks of wreckers. Lots, <laughs> lots of crash Jixxer 150s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's good to, to share that and help other people. What's next for the project? So the next major steps is well, I've got a, a big list on my phone of parts of the engine that need modification and changes for the plastic cases to the final production. I think the next step will be I'll finish the CAD drawings and then start production of the engine cases. That's going to be the next step. There'll be a lot of hand finishing once the engine cases are machined. Uh, I'm leaving a lot of stuff oversized because I don't have confidence that the overseas manufacturing was going to hit the numbers I want so I just want to make sure that once we get the cases I can hand finish them to what I want them to be and then it's just one step after the other then probably the next step will be uh, the loom ECU engine control system. So I'm going to build a custom loom for this bike it, everything will be running every single wire from scratch wiring every sensor from scratch and Kyle is the brains behind the ECU and all of the tuning software making a quick shift of work and all that sort of stuff. Tell us a bit about the computer that we're going to use, Kyle, and, and why it's different to the one that Glenn used on the Turbo FZR project. Yeah, so both the Turbo FZR project and my FZR 150, also known as the Sensible Twin on Kiwi Biker, um, <laughs> have 80 megabase ECUs, Speed Uno 80 megabase uh, ECUs. 
Um, so we're going towards uh, STM32. We're running the same firmware. So everything's very familiar for us. The advantage being uh, with the, the amount of frequency on the pickup being 24,000, actually probably higher. Why do you reckon this will rev through, Glenn? So at the moment, <coughs> the FZR250 revs to 18,000 RPM, but we have the 12 minus one pickup on the cam. Yep. So it's at half engine speed. And in my opinion, based on my tuning on that, we're at the limit of accuracy. Yep. So with this engine, because the pickup will be on the crankshaft speed, and with this engine it'll rev to somewhere around the 15,000 RPM, it would be the equivalent of the FZR revving to 30,000 RPM. Yep. Yep. So that's the what requires the additional speed of the ECU. Yep. So an 80 mega ECU will do 16 megahertz, whereas the STM32 base one is going to do 168. So it's a massive improvement. Yep. Plus... Plus we get heaps more analog inputs and digital inputs because we want to run things like EGTs on this yep. for extra tuning ability. Yep. See where we're, we're kind of settling in for falling. There's not much to say. It's just a speed uno. It's, it's pretty basic. Um, we're very used to it. We know the software now. We have confidence. How many... This is bike number four we've actually injected with a yeah. speed uno. Yeah, this so is bike number four. CBR... Yeah. And then two FZRs and then this. Yep. So it's really quite simple, but this, this will throw some challenges being a two-stroke, which the ECU firmware will, by default, it can handle two-strokes. So that's a good stepping stone. One of the biggest advantages of the Speeduino-based software is that Kyle is smart enough to know how to edit the code. I can come up with the control theories, but I have no fucking idea how to implement them into an ECU. I can talk to Kyle and be like, right, I want a fuel control table that does X, Y, Z. And then he can then do the code to modify the Speedwino stuff to do what I need to do. Which he's already done with the quick shift to control stuff. And then the next one with this would be the two strokes going to have some quite abnormal control tables in it for the fueling, if it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hopefully you guys aren't coming back to this video later and going, ah, see, they told you they couldn't fuel inject the two-stroke. <laughs> Ideally, yeah. uh, all of Glenn's theories and, and Kyle's programming are going to work, and this thing will be uh, fuel-injected twin-cylinder two-stroke. I'm confident. I've seen what these guys have done with the other projects, and uh, I think this is, I mean, not easy, but <laughs> definitely achievable. So... I think the next video you guys will see, this bike will be a bit more complete. Maybe the frame will have some paint on it. And you might be having a look at some billet engine cases.